our mission is to see lives awakened and families strengthened within a missional community by creating opportunities for Jesus Christ to reveal and manifest himself. An awakening of peace with God, power from God, and purpose for God. This is Salvation City Church. We are continuing a series called For His Glory. Uh, also within the bulletin there is a... Oh, that was weird. Um, there are... Sorry about that. There are some just announcements there for some get-togethers that we have coming up. I'll address those at the end of the morning. But uh, we're in our third part of this series, uh, For His Glory, which is really just... It's, it's, it's this unction, it's this calling from the Lord to get him the glory he deserves, to live in such a way that brings glory to his name. So the first week we talked about love in action. Uh, we launched the partnership with Care Portal, as well as just other initiatives that the church has to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Uh, speaking of that, we have a uh, encounter night, not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, followed by our commission outreach that we do once a month. So that's a great opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Uh, two Saturdays from now, we're going to meet here. We're going to talk about the plan. We're going to go door to door, knock on doors, and see if there are needs in the community that we can meet. And we're going to love on people. And we're going to just uh, see if we can meet those needs and give them the gospel. Uh, but last week also, we, we talked about this balance of being in the world, but not of the world. In the world, but not of the world. And just a quick recap, we have maybe some Christians, some believers who have been saved so long that they forgot about what it's like to be in the world. Being a Christian is not about escaping the world, but being in and active in the world, but not letting the world corrupt your heart so that you can continue to be a missionary for God and to bring the light to the dark areas. And there are others who you just come to the Lord and you're, you're learning the things of the faith and you're struggling with not being of the world. <laughs> you're in the world and you're of the world. You're imitating the world. You're acting like the world. But the Lord is calling you to consecrate yourself. And so it's these two things, right? As we mature, remembering that we're called to be light in the dark. And as we're sanctifying our life, remembering that we are not called to imitate the world, but to imitate Jesus. I believe this is the path that we're called to, to be the light of the world and to get God glory. So this morning, we're going to talk about discipleship. The title of this message is Dirty Discipleship. Dirty Discipleship. What does that mean? Jesus, Jesus was not afraid to get his hands dirty. Last week, we looked to the word, the ministry of Jesus, and the fact that he hung around sinners. He allowed unclean people to touch him. He got in the midst of even dead people. He was ministering to cities that, would, that were uh, cultivating pigs, which was unclean. Jesus was making mud and putting it on people's eyes. Jesus was doing all these things that, that look unclean. As a matter of fact, the religious people, when they looked at Jesus, they said, he's hanging out with sinners. He's unclean. But Jesus was in the world, but not of the world. And what was Jesus doing? What was Jesus doing around these people? He was making disciples. That's what he was doing. He was making disciples. Who, who were his first disciples? A bunch of fishermen, tax collectors, zealots, who were violent people. These are people that he called to be disciples. So we need to shake off this idea of like, oh, you know, ministry and making disciples. It's this, it's this clean, it's this walk in the, in the park. It's a nice, easy thing. No, I want to tell you guys today, the big takeaway this morning is that discipleship is messy, is dirty, it's hard, but it is the only way to live. Amen? Life on life. Life on life discipleship. Rubbing with people. And at the same time, bringing the love of Jesus 
<coughs> people that have never experienced love, that don't know how to receive love, bringing the truth of Jesus to people who they've lived their whole lives with lies. What do you think is going to happen when those two worlds collide? It gets messy. It gets dirty. It gets hard. It gets rough. But it's good. And it's what we're called to do. Just to describe discipleship for a moment, discipleship, a disciple just means student. It just means student, right? If you've ever uh, worked in corporate America and maybe you are assigned to train somebody, I know you train a lot of people at work, right? Anybody here ever done training? Like you've trained somebody at work, right? You're showing them the ropes. You're showing them how to do stuff. They've become your student. In many ways, that's kind of what discipleship looks like. But this discipleship is not learning a task. Discipleship is about learning a way of life, a way of life, a way of thinking, a way of acting. Discipleship is learning a way of life. Discipleship is coming under the teaching of Jesus. Coming under the teaching of Jesus. Discipleship means giving up your path and giving your life to the path that God has for you. Discipleship means I don't know the way, I need somebody to show me. So Jesus, show me the way. That's discipleship. Discipleship is humbly coming to the Lord and saying, I need help, teach me. That's discipleship. And we're going to talk about discipleship this morning as a body. We see discipleship all throughout the church, all throughout the scriptures. Uh, this next week we're going to be reading uh, Philemon. I always mispronounce it. Did I get that right this time? Philemon. Philemon. <laughs> we'll be reading Philemon. And he has a, a relationship, relationship with a man named Onesimus. Onesimus, once again, the pronunciation. <laughs> and, and Paul calls him his, excuse, yeah, Paul. Paul calls him his spiritual son. Paul calls the Corinthian church his spiritual children. It's discipleship that we see in the body. We see this as well with Paul and Timothy. If we look at the book of Timothy, he says this to him. He says, imitate me as I imitate Jesus. That's discipleship. Imitate me as I imitate Jesus. Let me say something about that because we've heard that a lot. Imitate me as I imitate Christ, right? Isn't it beautiful that he didn't just say, imitate me? But he said, imitate me as I imitate Jesus. In other words, the things that I do that reflect Jesus, imitate that. But there's going to be, maybe be some other things that I do that you should not imitate. <laughs> In other words, when you see me living like Jesus, imitate that. And I say it that way because I feel like a lot of people, they don't feel equipped to disciple others. They don't feel like they have the anointing or the calling to disciple others. They say, I'm struggling with too much. I'm, I'm dealing with too much. I don't know enough of the word. And they have all of these reasons to, to say, I'm not ready to disciple people. But I would encourage this body to set all of those ideas aside and to allow people to imitate the part of you that is imitating Jesus. And the Lord will sort out the rest. <laughs> the Lord will sort out the rest. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. That's discipleship. And even others who are looking to be discipled, you don't have to wait for the perfect person who imitates Jesus perfectly to disciple you. People have this fear, some that I've talked to, they have this fear of, oh, I can't follow that person, they're not perfect. If you're looking for the perfect person to follow, you will never find real discipleship within the context of the church. Yes, Jesus is the one that we should follow, absolutely. But there's this model given to us in the Bible of following men who follow Jesus. That's the model of discipleship. But a lot of people, they say, I'm waiting for the perfect person. And you know what? My pastor's not perfect. My father's not perfect. I can't find anybody in my circle who's perfect. So I'm going to find somebody online. I'm going to find a, a preacher who I really agree with, who really stirs me up, and he's going to disciple me. And they begin to watch, you know, T.D. Jakes and Joel Osteen, and they have this idea of, oh, yeah, I'm being discipled by him because I listened to his teaching. No, you're not, because discipleship is life on life. Discipleship is not just teachings, but it's observing a way of life. If you can't watch Joel Osteen in his home and the way he treats his wife and his children, that's not true discipleship. You're missing important pieces. But we're so scared of 
maybe learning or receiving from people who are imperfect. Listen, church, I'm imperfect, okay? (laughs) I am imperfect. But whatever is in me that is of Christ, I pray that you receive. You see how this works. Whatever is in me that is of Christ, I pray that you receive. And anything that is in me that's of me, I pray that the Lord protects you. (laughs) I'm just going to be honest. The reason why I say it like this is because the takeaway today is that Each of us are called to disciple others as well. And each of us are called to be discipled by someone else. But I want to break off some of these fears and inhibitions that prevent us from doing that. Discipleship is messy. Discipleship is dirty. Discipleship is hard. Discipleship is heartbreak. It's disappointment. But discipleship is also exciting. It's life-giving. Discipleship is where you, where you find your true calling and purpose, loving God and loving others within the context of raising someone up in the teachings of the Lord. Another great example of discipleship is just raising kids. <laughs> if you have kids, congratulations, you're called to be a disciple maker. You're qualified to make a disciple, to train up a child in the way that he should go so that when he is old, he does not depart from it. That's discipleship duplicating yourself and your children with your integrity, with your morals, with your values. It's discipleship. Another picture of discipleship I like to look at is, is, uh, is of course, Jesus with his disciples, but I want to look specifically at Jesus with Peter. We talk about Peter a lot. Yeah, Peter, that's right. So Peter, well, I'll just go to one scene. I'll go to one scene. I read this the other day and I felt like I, I needed to share it. Do you remember when the disciples were on a boat? Jesus told them to go the other side. And suddenly, they saw a man walking on the water, and they thought it was a ghost. You remember this scene, if you've, if you've heard it before. They thought it was a ghost, but Jesus says, Fear not, it's I. Don't be afraid. And Peter says, Jesus, if it's you, call me out in the water. And Jesus does. He calls him out in the water. And Peter He takes a step onto the water. He begins to walk like water, just like Jesus. And he's looking at Jesus and walking towards him, but then he begins to see the wind and the waves, and he begins to fumble and sink. But I love this. It says in Matthew that when Peter began to sink, Jesus caught him. When Peter began to sink, Jesus caught him. That's discipleship, man. When you walk with people, they fall and you catch them. But then you know what else Jesus says? He says to Peter, Oh, you of little faith. (laughs) Oh, you of little faith? Peter's the only one who got out of the boat. What are you talking about, Jesus? It's discipleship, man. It's always calling people higher. Being there to catch them when they fall and calling them up higher. And then they fall and you catch them and you call them up higher. It's discipleship. It's life on life. It's hard. It's dirty. It's messy. But it's life-giving. We are called to make disciples, not converts. We're called to make disciples, not converts. What do I mean by that? Well, you can pray a prayer with a thousand people, and you know what? That's good. Praise God. That's wonderful. But you're missing an important step if you're going to fulfill the Great Commission. Because Jesus said, go and make disciples. Go and live life with people and teach them a new way of life. My way of life. That's discipleship. Life on life. Relationship building. Bearing each other's burdens within the context of the church. That's discipleship. Discipleship happens in community. Discipleship happens in person. I mentioned this. You know, I mentioned earlier how people, they feel like they're a disciple of some, some famous minister. You know, what's, what's, what's missing, uh, and I love, I love big churches, but I'm just going to make a comment about big churches. They have their place, we have our place, it's beautiful, right? But people feel like they're being discipled by the man preaching. Oh, that pastor of a 5,000 person church, yeah, I'm his disciple. He's, you know, he's my spiritual father. But there's something missing there. 
Because that man is not holding you accountable to, for sin. That's the biggest missing piece. That's the big, I think that's one of the biggest reasons why people, they want this, they want this separation between themselves and, and a spiritual leader in their life, a spiritual father. They don't want to get too close because then they might see the sin in my life. Listen, church, that's the way it's supposed to be, is for them to see the sin in your life. Because discipleship is calling you up higher, right? Calling you into repentance, into a, a better life. And that can only happen with life on life. Rubbing, not this distant thing. I want to uh, walk us this morning through, uh, through a book, uh, just for a few moments, a very, very important book by Robert E. Coleman. It's called <coughs> The Master Plan of Evangelism. <coughs> Excuse me. The Master Plan of Evangelism. Uh, I encourage anyone to read this book if they have a desire to grow in the area of evangelism and discipleship. Uh, this book really is, is both. It's evangelism and discipleship, preaching of the gospel and life on life, leading people through the Christian experience. Um, and I'm going to walk you through these eight steps, but we're going to focus more on the first four, and then the last four we'll leave for another time. But it's eight steps along the way of becoming, living out, and multiplying disciples. All right, number one, first one, is selection. We're going to spend some time on this because I feel like a lot of people don't even know how to get started. And this is how discipleship starts, selection. I want to read from Matthew chapter 4. We can look at that for a second if you've got your Bibles or you can write it down. Matthew 4. I'm just going to read verses 18 through 22, the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Step one, in the process of evangelism and making disciples. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18, in the New King James. And Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, Jesus saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. He called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. When it comes to making disciples, I feel like many in the church are sitting and waiting to be called upon. They're waiting for somebody to knock on their door, say, hey, Don, will you disciple me? I need a spiritual father. Oh, sure, let's get started. That's not the process that Jesus shows us. What does Jesus do? He found people and he called them. And he said, come follow me. Discipleship begins with selection. There are people in your life that God is calling you to initiate a discipleship process. He's calling you to initiate it. He's not calling you to wait until they ask you questions about the Lord. He's calling you to initiate it, to say, hey, maybe it sounds something like this. Hey, coworker, man, I, ju I just see the call of God on your life. And I'd love, I'd love to show you a new way of living. Would you want to study the Bible with me sometime? <laughs> hey, coworker. You know, God loves you. He has a plan for you. Can I help you find that plan in your life? I'd love to help if I can. That's initiating. This, this, it's, this, it's this selection process. The Lord will, can highlight people in your life that you are called to call them up and out of their situation. Say, hey. I have something to share with you because I see something bigger in you. Can we talk about it? I'd love to share. Selection. Listen, church, we have to know what we carry. You carry the gospel. You carry a revelation of who Jesus is. 
You carry more than you realize you carry. The power of the Holy Spirit. So why are you so afraid in offering to people what you have? Because you have more than you think you have. I have learned in ministry that you don't know what you have until you take a step on the water. You don't realize what you can give until you begin to just give it. And the Lord begins to pour more into you and you pour out. But you've got to open up those floodgates. You've got to open up your mouth. You have to open up your heart to love people enough to step into their life to get a little messy and say, hey, I want to walk with you. Let me walk with you for a time. Hey, I heard that you're going through this really difficult season. I'm sorry to hear about your family member. Can I, can I just walk with you? I, I want to share with you some of the hope that I have found in Christ. Initiate the conversation. This is called selection. Listen, we got to be direct when it comes to this. You don't got to beat around the bush. You can be bold. You can be bold, I said, amen? amen. Bold about what you believe. Be direct with them. Hey, I want, can I, can I get you a cup of coffee? Hey, can, can I sit with you for lunch? Initiate the conversation. Be bold, be direct. And what happens is in this whole process, I'll just share this, is that you have, you have this wide net, right? This wide group of people that God has placed you around. God has put you around these people. And as you begin to talk with them and share with them and, and invite them into a relationship with the Lord, it begins to trickle down to the next step, to the next step, to the next step, to the next step, until you have, you know, in Jesus' case, the 12 disciples, right? Among all of the people that he ministered to. And so you've got this wide group. We're waiting for like, you know, what are we waiting for? I don't know. We're waiting for the Lord to open up the heavens and say, talk to this person. Do this. No, every person has a call on their life. And you can have this conversation with anybody. Okay? We just have to break out of our fear, perhaps, of people. But that's the first step is selection. Is selection. You know, I've, I've been in a discipleship process with many people in this church, with people even in this room. And I want you to know that I'm after you. I'm after you. <laughs> Everybody deserves to have somebody give up their life to see them serve Jesus. Do you know what I mean? Like everybody deserves to have that person that would say, I would give it all that you might know Christ. And I want to be that person to as many people as I can be. And if I'm not that person for you, I hope that God brings somebody in this body or in your ex extended you know, body of faith, somebody to say, I give my life that you might know Christ. That was the call of Paul when he wrote his letters. That was his ministry. I'm giving up my life so that you might know him. That's discipleship. Okay, the second step in the process of discipleship here is association. This one is simple. Association. Just hang out. Just being together. Just finding opportunities to be around each other especially opportunities when you can engage in your faith. Hey, have, you know, I'd love to sit with you for lunch. I do my Bible reading during lunch. You know, do you mind if I just read you a verse? It could be simple. Hey, let's go out for coffee at the end of coffee. Man, I just, I know you're going through that hard time. Can I just pray for you? This is how discipleship starts. And oftentimes it's the beginning of something long and beautiful and amazing, but it takes a start. But association is just beginning to live life together. This is why as a church, we have things like house fires, prayer night, commission. Why? Because we're inviting you into association. Get around other people, learn from them, and live out this discipleship process. Association. Get around people. Hang out. I'm going to move a little bit more quickly here. The third one. So there's selection, association. The next one is very important. Consecration. Consecration. This is where most people fall to the wayside in the process of being discipled. 
in the process of living this new way of life. It's consecration. It's when the conversation begins to sound like this. God is calling you to be holy. God is calling you to change the way you live. God is calling you to consecrate, to set yourself aside for His purpose. That's consecration. Consecration involves an invitation from someone who has been consecrated to say, come with me on this journey of being consecrated. And if I'm being honest, this is where most people, they say, it's too much, I'm leaving. If you remember, the rich young ruler came to Jesus and he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He wanted to be a disciple. Jesus lays out this plan of laying down his life, of the, the rich young ruler laying down his life, and he said, it's too much for me, I'm out. Jesus was calling him to consecration, and he said, it's too much, I can't do it, and he left. Listen, in the process of discipleship, and here is a church, there is a higher calling to live a holy life. Amen? We're not here to play games. We're not here to just have this soft and easy, live your best life, how to be blessed by God with 10 steps. No, this is a calling to be separate, to be consecrated, to be holy. So you wonder why maybe people fall to the wayside. A lot of times it's that consecration. Hey, it's time to live a holy life. I'll put it to you this way. Uh, Diedrich Bonhoeffer, uh, he became very famous with uh, Eric Metaxas' recent biography of his life. He, was, uh, uh, he lived in Germany before the time of World War II. He was a part of a Christian community who, uh, who they began to uh, basically wrestle with this tension of following the Nazi regime or standing up and being the church. And the church failed in that time, and the Nazi regime came through and took over. And so Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a part of this group who were really trying to stir something up in the body to speak up. But beyond that history point, he wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. The Cost of Discipleship. If we're looking at Matthew 4, at the end of Matthew 4, he's called all of his disciples. What does Jesus, what is Jesus' very next step after this? He selected them. He calls them to follow them, follow him, which is association. And then thirdly, what does Jesus begin to do in Matthew 5? He calls his disciples up on the mountain and he presents to them the Sermon on the Mount. He calls them into consecration. If you read the Sermon on the Mount, my goodness, there's no other teaching on consecration, on living a holy life than that. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, if you look with someone with lust, you've committed sin in your heart. <laughs> That's conviction into consecration, into holiness. Jesus said to love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. That's the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. That's the consecration that Jesus brought his disciples into before they began to do ministry. Consecration. God is calling you to live holy. And if you're going to claim faith in Christ, your life better reflect that or you're going to be a whitewashed tomb, you're going to be a rain cloud with no water, you're going to be a tree with dead roots, and you're going to struggle with feeling like, with feeling like you're, you're really born again. If you can't walk this hard path of consecration, of living holy. And in this church, we just happen to make, create an environment where if you are unwilling to consecrate your life, it's going to be hard. You're going to kick against the goads. And you're going to, it's going to be difficult because we're calling people to live holy. So consecration, if you want to learn to consecrate your life, it's Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. That will uh, set you straight in a second. <laughs> it will convict you into living a holy life. The fourth step here after consecration is impartation. Impartation. So, Selection, then you begin to hang out with them. That's association. Then, you, then there's this unction to live a holy life. That's consecration. And then something begins to happen when life on life begins to rub together. And there's love that is active in the relationship. That there is an impartation that begins to take place. So remember earlier when we prayed for Hezekiah, I talked about the fact that as disciples of Christ, there is a blessing on our life that we can pass on to others. 
Remember, I mentioned that. When Jesus, he told the 70, when you go in a home, uh, offer your blessing. That, that, in essence, is impartation. What I have in me, by you being around me, you're going to catch simply by association. That could be through prayer. I believe that when you pray for people, when you lay hands on people, that there's something that is exchanged. It's an impartation. That's why you got to be careful who prays for you. <laughs> who lays hands on you, yeah. <laughs> there's something that's exchanged. And as that's exchanged, there's, there's something begins to happen where there's life-on-life life duplication. Yep. Where, where there's an imitation that begins to take place. And that's really one of the next steps here. It's not, it's not exactly in the book, but there's an imitation that starts to happen. It's called impartation, right? Where the person being discipled is receiving, is fully receiving. It's a love that gives itself away. Now there's four more, and I don't want to go really late, but I want to just touch on the second half. Okay, the first half of discipleship, I think, is where we as a church need to be leaning into the most before we can begin to see the second half really take place. So my, my submission to you, my call to you, is to begin to walk these things out. Initiate the discipleship process with someone. Ask the Lord who is in your life that God is calling you to say, follow me as I follow Christ. Who is in your life? And begin to do life with them. So the, the last four, though, are these. I'm going I'm to read them all in a row, and then I'm going to describe them in a, in a certain way. It is uh, demonstration, delegation, supervision, and reproduction. Demonstration, delegation, supervision, reproduction. Here's an easy way to think of it. It's this process. It's, it's I do and you watch. And, and this, is, this is the process for developing any leader, for training any person to rise up. It's, it's like this. I do, you watch. Right? And let me, let me think of an example. Let's say it's sharing the gospel. Right? Learning to share the gospel with somebody. I think every Christian should have some method ready to go to quickly share the gospel with people. You have five minutes. What are you going to tell them? All right? So let's just look at that. That is an example. Okay? So, Leanne, I do, you watch. I'm going to, I'm going to present the gospel to this person. You just watch. Just watch and listen. Right? That is demonstration. The second step is delegation, which means I do but you help. So Leanne, come with me. I'm going to present the gospel. Okay, Leanne, one, could you just pray for this person? I'm, I'm doing the ministry, but could you help? I do, you help. That's delegation. Giving the person skin in the game. Letting them put their hands to what's happening. Be involved, right? Not just watch anymore. The third is supervision. Okay, now you do it, but I'm right here next to you. I'm right here, ready to, to, to step in when you need help, to assist you, to encourage you. You do, I help. Also within supervision is, you do, I watch, and then we talk after. So this is the process, right? So, Leanne, you do it, I'm right here helping you, right? I'll encourage you. Okay, now, you're going to do it, I'm just going to watch, I'm here, but I'm not going to step in. And then after that, we'll talk. We'll talk about what you did right, what you did wrong, how, can you, how you can improve, right? And the supervision part, that's where the most work is done, right? Of trusting someone to begin to step in and begin to do, right? So it's you do, I help, and then you do, and I watch. And then the last step and the ultimate goal in this disciple-making process is reproduction, which means, okay, Leanne, you do it. Now, Charmaine, you watch. That's how, that's how everything is built. That's how discipleship happens. I do, you watch. I do, you help. You do, I watch. You do, or excuse me, you do, I help. You do, I watch. And then you do and someone else watches. All right? And when it comes to discipleship, I want us to think of, think of this as a, as a way to maybe view this, right? Is there, is there something in your life that you are good at? 
that you can help someone else be good at. I just want to simplify discipleship for a minute and give you a very easy way to disciple someone. Is there something that you are good at, that you are knowledgeable in, that you can share that knowledge with someone else? Right? Let's say, uh, I'll give my wife as an example. Just, I'm trying to make it really simple for you guys. Brittany has been getting into uh, making sourdough bread. And I've gained a couple of pounds because of it. <laughs> she is, uh, she's made like, you know, 10 loaves. She's made uh, sourdough uh, uh, cinnamon rolls, sourdough breads, all kinds of stuff. And making bread is a pretty difficult process, actually. It's very, it's science. It's, it takes days to do it. Like, I don't have the patience for making bread. Like, I just want it now. But she's learning, right? But she's become pretty good at it, right? Now, let's take that as an example. Let's say Brittany, my wife is great at making sourdough bread. Is there someone in her life that has an interest in making sourdough bread? Yes? Great. <laughs> Guess what? And okay, and, but is there someone that she can find in her life that maybe she doesn't already have a close relationship with? This is the key, right? Somebody else to bring into her life. Hey, watch my life for a little bit. We're laughing because, you know, Mariah, Clarice, they all want to learn bread. But I'm putting this in the context of discipleship. Perhaps there's someone outside of Brittany's immediate circle who she can teach to make sourdough bread. So here's what happens. She says, hey, come on over. I'll do it. You watch. Okay, now I'm going to do it, but you help. All right, now you do it, and I'll help you. Okay, now you do it, and I'll watch, and we'll talk about it. And now you're going to do it, and I encourage you to go out and show someone else. Okay? And I'm, I'm saying literally doing this. I'm not using this as a metaphor. I'm saying, what if she literally did this? You know what's going to happen? And the process of her training someone else in just making sourdough bread, life on life, real discipleship, spiritual discipleship will also happen at the same time. It just has to. It can't not. You can't get around someone like Brittany who oozes the love of Jesus and not just begin to be transformed by it especially somebody who is not familiar with the love of God, who's never been around the love of God. Guys, this is, this is how simple discipleship can be. Is there a skill that you have? Is there something that you are passionate about that you can find someone else outside of your circle to instruct who is interested, allow life on life to rub together and let them observe your character and integrity in the process? Guys, this is discipleship. This is how real relationships are developed. No longer is it about bread, but it's about life. Because while, while they're hanging out making bread, they're watching Brittany, the way she talks to her husband. While they're making bread, she's, they're watching Brittany to see how she treats her children. To she, see how she talks about other people. While they're making bread, a tragedy happens within a month of that relationship. And they begin to watch and see how she reacts. That's discipleship. It happens. I'm trying to make this really simple for you guys. Is there something in your life that you are able to help somebody else with and to engage in that, right? To say, hey, you have an interest in this. Can I help you? I'd love to help you. Come on over. I'll, I'll show you how. What is it? Is it, I don't know, working on cars? Is it playing an instrument? That's one of the most, most popular discipleship methods within the church because there's a lot of music in church, right? And young people will come and they'll just come to learn an instrument. But give them five years and they're on fire for the Lord. What happened? Because it was no longer about learning guitar, but it was about them watching someone's life and begin, beginning to imitate the life. This is why coaches are so powerful. Coaches are such, such, such amazing opportunities to, to see kids come to life because it's no longer about the sport after time. But it's about kids watching someone's life. Is there something simple? Is it cooking? Is it writing? Is it whatever? Maybe it's your, your job skill. Maybe it's marketing. Maybe it's accounting. What is it that you can offer to someone else for free as an opportunity to disciple them? No obligation to even bring up the gospel. The gospel is just going to happen as they live with you. Are you guys understanding this? I'm, I'm leaning into this a little bit more until the Holy Spirit sparks something in each person and the Lord says, do that. Find somebody to do that with. What is it, church? 
What is it that the Lord can call you to do with someone else? Are we okay? Is this making sense? I want to close with a few more thoughts here. I want to talk about maturing from disciple to disciple maker. Because as you go through that process of discipleship, there comes a point when then the one being discipled is then called to multiply themselves. Those of you that have been born again for a long period of time, besides your own, your own children, I want to ask you, have you discipled someone? Have you walked through this process with someone? And if not, can you stretch your faith to believe God, to highlight someone in your life to engage with, to step into life with intentionally? Is there someone? Because you're not called to just be a disciple of Jesus and just be hunky-dory, comfy, relaxed. God's calling you into the challenge, into the messiness of making more disciples. So where does that, how does that process begin? Well, for those of us who desire to multiply ourselves, to build disciples, I just want to share a few things. First and foremost, first and foremost, man, we got to get deep spiritual roots. You got to put your roots deep. You got to put your roots deep in the word, in prayer, in, in, the, in the body of Christ. With deep roots, deep roots, so that you can help someone else. If you're going to disciple others, this is important, you're going to need a large measure of love, patience, and grace towards others. You want to talk about messy discipleship, dirty discipleship. Listen, when you, when you begin to believe in someone and invest your life into someone, and they fail you over and over and over, they disappoint you again and again and again, you're going to need some great grace from God to love them through that and not give up on them. Everyone needs someone who will not give up on them. And if you come here, I'm doing my very best to not give up on anyone. By the grace of God, by what he's called me to do, I will not give up on you. I will not. I will not give up on you. But if you're going to disciple someone else, you need that, that same, that's why your roots got to be deep because you've got to be unshakable. I'm not going to be discouraged. I'm not going to be shaken. Even Jesus' own disciples failed Christ again and again and again. Whether they were fighting with each other to see who would get to sit at his right hand, whether it was Peter denying him, whether the, the, so many times the disciples messed it up, but Jesus kept them close nonetheless. But you've got to have Great grace. People will let you down, but don't be discouraged. That's why it's messy, man. That's why it's messy. Man, when you begin to get life on life with people and their world begins to fall apart, <coughs> man, it can, be, it can be a burden. It can be hard. But it's what we're called to do. It's, not, it's the burden from the Lord. A lot of times we'll, we will minister to people, walk with people some things, with, through some things, and it becomes heavy, and it becomes hard, and you think, I can't, I'm not, I can't do this anymore. This is not my burden. Well, you better ask the Lord, because maybe it is. We're so quick to give up on people. Maybe it is the burden that the Lord is calling you to carry, and His grace will be sufficient for you. Paul carried the burden of some Crazy, rebellious, angry people. The Corinthian church were constantly falling back into sin, falling back into listening to false apostles. He compares them, I believe, even to a thorn bush that he, that he would get close to and they would pierce him. I'm going back to 2 Corinthians, I believe it's 9 or 10, where Paul says, Jesus told me his grace is sufficient for me. Okay, lastly, if we're going to be making disciples, we talked about consecration. Here's the consecration piece. You got to live a life worth duplicating. You got to live a life worth copying. Live a life that's worth duplicating. I want to share with just a few tools and then we're going to close in prayer. Um, as a church, we have a discipleship program. Uh, 
Most, if not all of us, have gone through it. If you haven't, it's something I want to encourage you to do. We take discipleship very seriously. The discipleship program is 13 weeks of in the Word with somebody that you're partnered with. It's scripture memorization. It's weekly phone calls and prayer. It's an opportunity to invite people into a life-on-life journey into becoming more like Jesus. It's called Peace with God. After that, we also have Power from God, which is the next step into that duplication process. It's evangelism and the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, we have these things baked into the ministry because we believe heavily in the call to make disciples. And so if you have a desire to be discipled, if you feel like you're alone in that, talk to somebody, talk to me, and we're going to get you partnered up. We're going to find a way to find somebody who will never give up on you, you know, and to partner that up. Okay, let's, go, let's close in prayer here if you don't mind. We're going to pray. And as we pray, here's what I want to do. I want to pray for two sides. The first side is this. If you're feeling lonely in your journey and you need somebody to come alongside you, We're going to ask the Lord for that to take place, for you to be discipled. On the flip side, if the Lord is calling you to begin to make disciples of your own, and remember, I do have to clarify, sometimes this gets mixed up. When I say disciple, it's not like, it's not like, you know, going back to the Leanne thing. It's not like, Leanne, you're my disciple. No, 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 you're, you're, you're Jesus's disciple, right? But there is a relationship that God calls us to build that is focused on your development that I have an honor to be a part of, but you're ultimately Christ's disciple, right? I don't own anybody, if I could put it that way. I don't own anybody. Okay, anyways. So maybe you are need, you're needing that push from the Lord to step into discipling somebody else. Ask the Lord to reveal to you who that is and be ready to step into obedience of that. Okay? So let's pray together if we could. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, this good news is too good to keep to ourselves any longer. God, the transformation that's happened in my life and and in the life of others here is too amazing to not see happen again. Lord, I pray by the Spirit of God that there would be an awakening in our hearts to step into this discipleship path, to live as a disciple of you and to go out and make more disciples. So Lord, I pray for spiritual mothers and fathers to rise up, to take their place, and to begin to find those orphans who are in need. I, just, I speak that specifically over people who have been in the faith for a while. The Lord want, is calling you into spiritual motherhood and fatherhood to disciple someone. Let the Lord speak to you right now. And God, for those who desire to be discipled, God, I pray for a grace, a grace, Lord, to bring someone into their life, to walk with them through fire, someone for them to imitate as they imitate the Lord, a spiritual father and mother. God, I pray for just a connection to take place in this body. And Lord, that I pray especially that it reaches beyond this body, Lord, there are so many who are lost, who are looking. If somebody would just step in and say, I believe in you. I want to help you follow me as I follow Christ. God, I pray for a boldness to have those conversations, God. For just a a, a, a knowing that we know that there's something in us that you've put in us, and it's Christ, that needs, that demands to be duplicated and to not be withheld anymore. God, give us revelation of that power that is within us. Help us, God, to make disciples. Help us, Lord, to be obedient to your call, not to make converts, but to make disciples, Lord. And Lord, I pray that we would not get rest 
until we step into obedience to this call. In Jesus' name, can we say amen together? Yes. Amen. 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 Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, I love you guys. Listen, just a little bit of direction. In your bulletins, um, there is a flyer. I just want to remind everybody of a couple of dates. This week we have house fires. Next week we have prayer on Wednesday night at the church. And then on Saturday we meet here to strategize how we're going to reach this community with the love of God. And then also, if you have your, a flyer here, a few announcements. If you are a lady in the house, I see some of you ladies who love Jesus. There is a conference coming called Worthy that we uh, are a part of, that we join every year. And uh, this year's theme is called Return to the Garden. It is July 12th and 13th. It is at Arise Church in Brandon. And this is a, a powerful weekend of just coming together, woman of faith, to encounter the Lord. Uh, they do a, a beautiful job of just making it all about Jesus. <laughs> so I encourage you to scan the QR code on that. If you want more information, all the information is online. Scan the QR code. Um, also, summer game nights. This is going to be new information for everybody. As we come into the summer, we are not having house fires. Instead, we're going to meet at 6 o'clock every Wednesday night at the Champion Home, Mariah and Nate. And we're just going to hang out. We're going to hang out through the summer, play games. This is a great opportunity to bring somebody with you to have fun. Maybe that gifting in your life is you are just excellent at playing Go Fish. And that's what God wants to use to disciple someone. And they're going to they're gonna watch you. And then they're going to help you. And then you're going to help them, right? No, I'm just kidding. But it's a good opportunity to, to just come and have fun. Uh, we're going to share, bring a snack if you can. Bring maybe something to eat. We're all going to hang out together. But that begins uh, the week after Encounter Night, okay? So house fires, then Encounter Night, then game night for the summer. Um, there is one night that we are still having prayer on the 17th of July, so just be sure to watch your calendar for that. Okay, lastly, we have a pool party at the end of this month at the Hendersons on uh, June, was it 30th, I believe? Yeah. June 30th, 4 o'clock. This is a bit of a drive from here. It's out, out in uh, Valrico, but they have a ridiculously awesome pool with a slide, shallow end and a deep end. It's amazing. Ping pong, games, food. It's going to be a great time. So if you could come, that's a Sunday afternoon on the 30th. All right. Okay. If we could stand up, I want to pray a blessing over you and then we'll dismiss. All right. Can we just lift our hands to the Lord as we close? Thank you, Lord. Can we just pray that? Can you just pray this after me? Say, Jesus, Jesus. I will do what you tell me to do. I will say what you tell me to say. And I will go where you tell me to go. I trust you and I love you and I will serve you. And Lord, I pray that this would be sealed by the Holy Spirit as we go out this week. We're going into a mission field. I pray that we would always keep that in mind, God, that we are in this world to shine our light, to be in it, not of it, to make disciples and to see this region change by the love of God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hallelujah. Well, we love you guys. God bless you.